Take a look up on the wall. Oh, Robin Hood. Yes. One of the greatest films. As it's a friend said to me once, uh, uh, a chap I worked with, worked with years ago, Bruce Pittman, mm -hmm. he said to him, and I agree, it was a perfect motion picture. Exactly. Yeah. No, you're right. My favorite, maybe some other film of all time, but in terms of perfection, oh. this is one of the best ever made. Exactly. The nothing color. wrong with that movie. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Everything. That it Eric is. Wolfgang Korngold scores. And there it is with the, oh, his, there he his, is. his baton floating oh, no. in front of the music. That remarkable composer. Right. And that's a film that he didn't want to do the music for. He felt that uh, it was too, uh, it wasn't serious enough for him. He was a classical mm. composer. He won the Academy Award for the film. Laura. What a, Laura, Laura, Laura. I, that, that, I guess, put uh, uh, David Raxon right. I guess that was the picture, wasn't it, that dropped you, oh, yes. your, 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 your yes. fame, and you have people like myself coming a few years after, and, uh, <laughs> and there it is. Could you let, let us re remind us what that sounded like? If I could prevail upon you, sir. Oh, you can, you can. I'm not sure I'm the ideal performer of it, but I'll no. play a little. <clears throat> I right. think you're going to have to edit this. Uh, I was slaving away trying to come up with the right um, piece. And uh, on Saturday morning, I got a letter from a lady uh, with whom I was in love. I was married to her. She was in New York working on a show. And I could not make out this letter. I couldn't figure out what it was that it was saying. And uh, so I put it in the pocket of my working jacket and uh, forgot about it. And then on Sunday night when I'd about given up, the whole thing, I um, resorted to an old stratagem, which I used to use when I was a kid. If I got stuck on something, ran into a block, I would take a poem or a story or a photograph or a painting or something and put it up on the piano and improvise, and that would take my mind away. So I just reached into my pocket without thinking, took out this letter, smoothed it, and put it on the um, rack, the piano rack, and began to play. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized what the letter was saying, which was, farewell, buddy. Wow. And, uh, wow. yeah, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But at that moment, I hit on the tune just exactly that doesn't and uh, wrote it down quickly. Yeah, it sounds... Oh, no, I love it. Sorry, right. I love that. I think that's fascinating. I love your camera. Well, you. One of these days, you may see it in the Warner Brothers picture. And then I did so many musicals, goodness, it's, that's so time-consuming with playbacks and uh, so that you can only do so much. But music's been my whole life. That's very exciting to meet you, sir. And uh, could you tinkle something there? What am I going to tinkle? Anything. Piano needs tuning. <laughs> I love it, I love it. I was never really interested in music to begin with. I mean, I, I studied music, I studied piano, I went to school and studied music. Um, my dad died when I was 14. Um, when he was alive, I guess I was more interested in playing baseball than I was in, in being musical. Uh, and when he died, uh, I found myself kind of veering towards uh, creative thinking. It had never occurred to me to think creatively before. And when he died, I don't know if it was trying to fill in some empty shoes or what, yeah. I, I have no idea. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it, it's been daunting in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a, it's a big umbrella, and uh, it, it, sometimes it's real hard. You, you, you tend to be known as part of the Newman family as opposed to uh, just Tom Newman. Yeah. My father worked like a dog. In the old days, when he was a 20th Century Fox, they had a staff of composers. And as you know, or maybe as you don't, there were lots more films that would run through. He was at 20th Century Fox. Right. There are many films that would run through every year that he was responsible for. So I remember him saying they, they, there was no uh, choice but to get them done. So they would work and work and work. He used to say he didn't think much of himself as a writer. And I think he probably did. I, I think there's probably something in us all that thinks that if we write music for movies, we're working for other people and we're working in entertainment and less for our, our own creative muse. Uh, and uh, I think that bothered him. He, was, I, he also said that he was more interested in conducting. 
what he didn't like, he said, was uh, uh, the, the kind of solitary nature of composing, which I know, it, it's very lonely and, uh, and scary. You look at a, a blank page and it's, it's oftentimes really frightening. You know, mm. you, you, jo you jolly well do. I look at a lot of blank pages, <laughs> <laughs> often. I got a telegram from Hollywood asking me if I'd like to come out and work with Charlie Chaplin on Modern Times. Well, this would be 36 period, would it? 1935, 35, 35, I guess. 35. Uh -huh. And uh, so I came out to Hollywood and uh, worked with Charlie on Modern Times, and that was the beginning of my stay here. Well, tell us about Charlie, and tell us what it was like to work with that man on Modern well, Times. Well, he, uh, of course, Charlie Chaplin was one of a kind. I don't think there's ever been anybody else quite like him, nor is there likely to be one like him. He was, um, uh, nobody needs to have me say he was a brilliant, wonderful man. He uh, was um, not used to being differed with or defied, and I was just young enough to uh, express myself when I disagreed with him about things, and after a very brief time, about a week and a half, he fired me. <laughs> what a way for, to start. <laughs> yes, wasn't it? And uh, that really hurt. I guess. But um, he needed, see, he didn't know how to, uh, to write music down. And he didn't know how to develop his ideas, how to extend them. He'd come up with little phrases or fragments. He needed somebody to help. So that's what I was doing. And I disagreed with him about some of the things he was doing. I now look upon that as arrogance. But I wanted the music to be as good as it could possibly be. Well, anyhow, Alfred Newman, who was going to conduct that picture, which was Modern Times, um, got a look at the sketches I'd been making of the music and uh, uh, said to Charlie, you'd be crazy to fire this guy. You have no idea what he's doing with his music. So um, Charlie sent out uh, a feeler saying he'd like to rehire me. And I said, uh, under no conditions, unless I can have a real understanding with him, because otherwise he'd just fire me again. So I had a session with him, which lasted several hours, in which I tried to explain that I was not merely being <clears throat> willful and perverse, but that I cared a lot for his picture and I liked him a lot, and that if he could stand having somebody who would argue with him uh, for the purposes of the picture, then I'd be glad to come back to work. And he said, fine. And so we worked together for four and a half months. I work on a 10-week contract, and up until about the middle 70s, that meant that I would come in the picture, and the day I was given a start date, and that day I would come in and see the film, and then see it a few more times, and decide when the music was going to go, and so many weeks later I'd record it, and then we'd dub it, and it would all fit within a 10-week, yeah. not today. But if I get five weeks to write a picture, it's, it, it's terrific. When the picture's finished when I get it, it's a miracle, which it isn't. Now, I can't tell you the last time I've sat I've started a film and had it complete. I mean, a lot of it is, is, is special effects. We're waiting for special effects. I was wondering why that uh, special effects, you're giving an answer there. But well, that's one of the answers. Yeah. And the other one is I think that we're dealing with different type of filmmakers. I mean, I hate to date myself. It sounds sort of old fashioned. But back then, when? But it seemed that, you know, 15 years ago, uh, I don't know. They we were, planned better ahead? Well, is that it, or it no? seemed that things ran, it was a different system, uh, fewer auteurs to begin with. Almost no producer I've ever worked with really knows anything about music. Well, in a way, they don't have to know. What you do want them to know is what they expect from the music and to be able to tell you something about that. And uh, every so often you'll get a director or a producer who can do that, but they're very few and far between. Besides which, they know very little about the language of music itself, and their thoughts tend to be on the pretty side. A director will say to me, uh, well, why don't, didn't you write me some pretty music? And I mean, that happened on Apache. And I said to him, here you've got a guy running around shooting people with arrows, uh, burning up forts, and committing all kinds of violence and everything like that, and you want me to write pretty music? You've got the wrong man. That's, that epitomizes that sort of situation. What I like best is when you get some director who has learned to trust you or to trust musicians, 
And I understand his discomfort at not knowing what's going to happen. But if you've worked with him, he knows what you can do. And then what he does is he tells you about how he sees the picture and what part he wants music to play in it. The two of you discuss things, and eventually you go home and write the music. He hears it. Generally, you do your best in that way. You can't have a guy hanging over your shoulder telling you the fingering on the violins. It's simply not going to work. But if I respect their dramatic instincts, usually they have great musical instincts because yeah. it's kind of the same thing. Um, so uh, it, it all depends on, on what people find comfortable. But normally I work closely with the director because I figure at some point or another they're going to have strong opinions about the music. So I might as well get their opinions before I'm, I'm uh, in front of an orchestra. Yeah. What makes for a good relationship between composer and director? Well, I think that, uh, that they sort of finish the process without wanting to kill each other. Well, I've often said that a composer and a director in their first meeting and first together there's like a man and a woman on their first date are always sort of polite and sparring around nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings not <laughs> showing their best behavior and i think it's the least creative i think that something good comes out of it why well, then that's that's you know, terrific but as you work more and more together you're more relaxed and i think that the ideas you know, flow back and forth but he gives you a lot of freedom you think <laughs> you think, oh. but, but within certain parameters. But he doesn't tell you what the parameters are. And he starts moving you, and all of a sudden you find yourself that you are writing the right music. Oh, so that's a talent. That's a talent. Right. That's Not a, every director that's a, has it. That's no. a director.